This is my friend, Dr. William Jimenez, suited up to go into an exam room to treat a COVID-19 patient in New York City. William and I had uh, planned to meet this past week in Puerto Rico so his kids could enjoy their spring break on the beach and so that William and I could sit on the balcony and solve all of the world's problems. But unfortunately, the world's problems came to New York and most of the rest of the world before we were able to board our flights. But we talk most days now about what it's like for him to be on the front lines of a battle where now 65,000 Americans have died in just the last two months. And where there is still no real cure, there is not much of a treatment, and no vaccine is realistically in sight. I worry because I think my friend William is, is uh, well, I think he's too sensitive. I think he's, I think his heart's a little bit too big for this work. When one of his longtime patients contracts the virus and dies, William suffers so dramatically from each loss that I'm sincerely worried for him and, well, worried for all the patients in New York and Washington and in New Jersey and in New Orleans. But he keeps telling me, this is what I was born to do. This is my calling. It's that kind of courage and devotion that makes New Yorkers go outside every night at seven and applaud and blow their car horns and bang on pots and pans on their balconies, showing appreciation for our nation's healthcare workers. But my concern for the stress my friend is under was heightened this week when I learned that a young ER doctor in the hospital where William has worked, a physician who had COVID-19 recovered and went back to work, a physician who was even making masks during her recovery for her friends to wear at the hospital until she could get back, she succumbed to the overwhelming sadness of it all and she took her own life. Dr. Lorna Breen's father is also a physician and he told reporters that his daughter was as surely a casualty of the pandemic as any one of the patients who had died on a ventilator at the hospital. And he asked only that she be remembered as a hero. And that she was. Now I know that all of you get this. You've heard most of this in the news. I know that even if you don't personally know someone who's been a patient or has been on the front lines of patient care, I know that your heart has been just as filled with grief as mine. But here is what you may not know. In the midst of all this drama, all this grief, this strain, William and the other doctors in his group got an email this week telling them that they would not be paid in April. You see, the measures taken to deal with the pandemic, they've had to cut back patient load, they do video conferencing, they've had to cancel elective surgeries, they're reserving space in hospitals and clinics for an unquantifiable surge of coronavirus patients, and that has meant that physicians are not billing a third as much as they usually bill. So their overhead has taken up all of their income and their employer is just telling them, not only are you going to work harder under more stressful circumstances, not only are you going to risk your life every day when you go to work and risk the health of your family when you go home, not only are you going to be treated for PTSD in all likelihood when it's all over, but you're going to do all this without being paid. No rent money, no grocery money. How crazy is that? And locally, while our hospitals ramped up to prepare for pandemic patients, emptying offices and rooms for a surge of patients that we frankly have not seen yet in Missouri, so now the hospitals are laying off, firing, or furloughing thousands of employees. In fact, my friend William shared this email with me from a surgeon in his group who wrote to his peers literally begging them to send him referrals of patients that he could do surgery on in his office after hours so that he could 
earn enough money to pay his rent this month. Now, I'm sure he's a great guy. I'm just not sure that I want a surgeon putting a scalpel to me who's under that kind of pressure. Just when people in Italy and Germany and England and all over America are standing tall to give tribute to healthcare workers for taking care of us in the midst of this medical crisis, our hospitals are giving out pink slips to some of these heroes. Now, this is not happening in Canada. It's not happening in Great Britain, where their national health care services employ the doctors, nurses, therapists, cooks, and cleaners to serve the health care needs of their citizens. In the United States, our health care system is based on profit derived from illness. The individual doctor or nurse may have the highest and most noble of motivations to be of service to us, and yet our system, our system, is about the bottom line. And as little sympathy as I typically have for our hospitals and health insurance companies, right now, here in our state of Missouri, we are losing, our hospitals are losing, $30 million of income a day. And even as harsh as I can be about them, they can't sustain that level of loss. But what is wrong here is our system. We have not designed our health care system to deliver health care. We have designed it to make money. And profit is not now, nor has it ever been, the issue with illness. I've been saying this for 40 years. But now the coronavirus is making it painfully clear. <coughs> we need to get health care out of the marketplace and get it back into human service as it should always have been. The capitalism that may, may work very well in competition among fast food restaurants or coffee shops or retail clothing outlets, maybe even lawn services, that system does not work in healthcare. We spend twice as much per citizen as most Western nations, yet we fail to care for more than 10% of our population, and the people who do receive care typically have worse outcomes than in other Western countries. Though many politicians still like to loudly proclaim that the United States has the best healthcare system in the world, the objective truth is we're not in the top 10. I know that print's too small for you all to read, but we're not even in the top 25. In fact, among the developed countries of the West, we are dead last. Considering all the nations of the world, nearly 170 nations, we're number 59. <coughs> the only category in which we were rated number one in January of this year was the United States was considered, get this, to be the best prepared to deal with a pandemic. Now, I don't know who made that speculation, and I don't know where he's selling used cars now, but I know that the actual pandemic has proven that we were hopelessly, poorly prepared for a pandemic. I am, of course, very worried about the nearly 30 million people who have lost their job since the 1st of March. But I'm forced to wonder how many of those 30 million have historically been in opposition to giving Medicare to everyone because they liked their employer-provided health care. How do they like it now, now that they don't have an employer? It's amazing how clear this issue becomes when the comfortably insured suddenly find themselves among the ranks of the uninsured. Honestly, I don't have much sympathy for people who are crying wolf now, who refuse to find any compassion in their hearts for their uninsured neighbors and relatives, but now they may finally be realizing that even though they have opposed the efforts of Franklin Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, John Kennedy, Johnson, Carter, Clinton, Obama, all of whom tried to give health care to everyone, and they have been thwarted for 80 years. Isn't it clear that it's time for that stupid battle to be over? Health care is just a prime example 
of why our economic system is broken and demands to be changed to something that is less tied to the feudal lords who enslaved the peasants of medieval Europe in order to make them rich. We were not prepared for a pandemic, not with PPE, masks, hand sanitizer, or ventilators, and we are not morally or ideologically prepared for the economic implications of a pandemic. We seem to think that the way that the economy has worked is the way that it has to work, that we've inherited this system of sort of cannibalistic capitalism over the past two centuries, where the only way to have money is to either be born rich or to work for a salary. But look at how we divide up our public and private work. Teachers have been told to stay home. Some of them are teaching online. Some of them are being asked to call their students on the telephone just to check in with them. There have been a couple of times even in my neighborhood where the teachers from a nearby elementary school have driven by in a parade of cars as families stood in their lawns and they honked their horns as students waved. But they are not teaching in a classroom, yet they're being paid. They're being paid the same. Doctors who are being confined to video conferences and exams get paid little or nothing unless they do something that is really quite obscene, which is to order an MRI or a CAT scan or some expensive procedure for which they can bill. And trust me, a lot of doctors get desperate enough that they add additional uh, treatment uh, plans or diagnostic plans so that they can get paid. Why? Since the pandemic is forcing both teachers and physicians to online work, why wouldn't we pay our physicians for complying with the pandemic regulations just like always? Last month, I applauded the government's decision to send $1,200 to every American adult. I don't know very many people who've gotten it yet, but but it is ostensibly on the way. But even then, I saw it only as a good start. If we could get our heads out of feudal economics, we could realize that we really should give a universal basic income to everyone every month. And I'm not going to wade into a conversation about modern monetary theory, although if you don't know anything about it, you can look up the best of the left uh, podcast episode on modern monetary theory, and that's a good hour-long education. But just suffice it to say, even if you have to look at our budget through a Keynesian economic lens, that we currently operate 800 military bases in 70 nations. Now, folks, that is not defense. That is an empire. If we dramatically reel in our massive and indefensible military spending, we could balance our current budget, still giving Americans a universal basic income, universal health care, and tuition-free college. Now, it may be above my pay grade to say how many military bases on foreign soil that America really needs, but just for example, we have nine in Colombia alone, and they are there to stop the drug trade from South America into the USA. Nine military bases. And as best I can tell, the drug trade out of South America to North America is unimpeded. So just imagine you had nine franchises of Taco Bell around town. Nine. And not a one of them had sold a taco in 20 years. How much longer would you want to keep paying the overhead to operate your Taco Bells if they weren't going to sell any tacos? People act like this can't be done, when in fact, it would be as easy as, as falling down these stairs, which many of you know that I have already done. You have destroyed that, haven't you, Rob? That, that video doesn't exist anywhere, does it? So now that we've closed down the retail and service economy almost everywhere except Sweden, and Sweden is operating 
a, a very dicey experiment to see if they can reach herd immunity without doing much social separating. Currently, the death rate in Sweden is nine times what their neighbor's death experience has been. So this is, this is a, a tough uh, path to try to follow, but American governors are now determined that even though the rate of infection has not actually slowed down, that they are going to start lifting the mandatory closing. Our governor says that restaurants, bars, hair salons, and retail shops can reopen on Monday. And of course, people are not going to just go rushing back into those places because most people know that they're still not safe. And shop owners who have to restrict the number of people who can come in and try to get them to stay several feet apart will not be able to have the volume of business necessary to turn a profit. But what lifting the ban does is it will keep those business owners from applying for business stoppage insurance, and it will keep their staff from drawing unemployment. This means that they have to go back to paying their landlord, they have to go back to paying their utility bill, and it cuts them out of being able to apply for any special assistance from either the state or the federal government. This is vicious, cannibalistic capitalism on the part of several governors in the United States. Rather than change the system to recognize the lethal nature of the pandemic, they're going to force people to die to support an economic system that is obscenely out of date an economic system that should have been ended in the early 20th century and now in the 21st century is just killing us. But the one thing that should be obvious to everyone is that all of these billionaires crying out to send people back to work are realizing that they were never the ones who were making their money. Their employees are the ones who are making money and without the people that they have refused to give health care, a living wage, and make of education available to them, without those people, they will go broke. But here is what you can bank on. Missouri's Governor Parsons will not be going to a bowling alley and renting shoes and using one of the bowling alley's balls. His family will not be crowded into a booth at TGI Fridays, and they won't be getting their hair cut at Hudson Hawk Barbershop. They want you to risk your life, but they will not be risking theirs. There are very few things that will make me dive for the TV remote to change channels faster than hearing the voice of Bill Crystal. But even he, and if you don't know him, let me just tell you, this guy is so far to the right that most Nazis wouldn't be seen in public with him. But even he has bemoaned the hypocrisy of sending employees back into meatpacking plants where hundreds of employees have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and where many have already died. In the current system, the corporation is giving uh, is being given a waiver by the federal government, giving a liability waiver for any incidents that may occur by putting thousands of employees inches apart working in the meatpacking industry. But if any of the workers refuse to go into that unsafe circumstance, they can be fired and they will not, not then draw unemployment benefits. And yes, this is specifically Republican hubris but still you can't see it as being separate and apart from a system of capitalism that favors profit over people. Now I'm a Southern boy and I don't want to run out of country ham for my biscuits and I don't want to be denied pulled pork, but if I have to pay more for it so that these guys can have a safe work environment, well, what kind of monster would object to that? other than Republican elected officials in Iowa. We've always hoped that electing women to high office would give us better government, but in a word, Kim Reynolds was obviously the wrong woman 
to elect. Years ago, Warren Buffett made the observation that class warfare has been going on for years and the rich people are winning. The current crisis brings into focus who is valued in society and who we believe we can dis discard or disregard. <coughs> people this seriously calls for, and I, and I don't use this word lightly, this calls for a revolution. Nothing short of the poor demanding a more fair distribution of wealth will work. The rich will not do the right thing simply because it is the right thing to do. They will, however, do the right thing when they are given no other options. And that is the point that America must come to. Last year, Frank Snowden published this frighteningly prophetic book, Epidemics and Society. Now, he's a history professor at Yale, so he wasn't actually trying to predict a pandemic a few months ago, but he was painstakingly describing the way that epidemics either shape society or show society who they are, like holding up a mirror to them. This pandemic is forcing us to realize who we value and who we don't. It is no accident that people of color are dying in numbers way out of proportion to the white population, because as in the plague and other epidemics, the people who live in the most crowded conditions, the people who have the poorest diets, the people with the least access to health care are much more likely to die. And as we are seeing in Trump's insistence that meatpacking employees go back to their dangerous and low-paying jobs, we cannot feign surprise at the fact that the majority of those employees are people of color. They are Hispanic, they are Asian, and they are black. Again, it is the system we have, but it is not a necessary part of nature. Our system is the one that doles out the best health care to the top of the income ladder, and the whole employer-based health care system keeps the unemployed from having reasonable access to health care at all. That's not nature. That is not human need. That is an economic system designed by the rich for the rich. And though the doctor's lounges at Mercy and Cox hospitals, I can tell you from personal experience, have been full of Trump-supporting, aspiring millionaire physicians for the last several years, I suspect that things have fallen rather quiet lately. I bet that even I could walk into a physician's lounge today at Cox or Mercy and make the observation that physicians in England's national health care system work fewer hours, have a much better standard of living, and a much higher job satisfaction than American doctors do. And today, at least, I could walk out of the lounge without a scalpel in my back. How we react to an epidemic depends greatly on who is the most likely to die. Governor Kim Reynolds will send workers back into meatpacking plants, but members of Congress are still refusing to cram their more than 400 members into a room that is a lot smaller than it looks like it is on TV. In the 1980s, you remember how married and straight people reacted to the AIDS epidemic, which was perceived to be almost exclusively a gay liability. The news media for years blithely used the term innocent victim to reference someone who had been exposed to HIV through a blood transfusion or an accidental needle stick as if gay people were somehow inherently not innocent because they had had sex. Sex is, of course, something that the rest of us have never done. Right? I mean, this, this is the church of perpetual virginity, isn't it? Or is there something you guys have forgotten to tell me? Compare that to how people reacted to things like tuberculosis or polio, which affects the rich and the poor, the young and the old equally. A pandemic can teach you a lot about who you really are. When we hear about an Ebola outbreak, 
we need to stop thinking of that as an African problem, just as we need to stop thinking of poverty as someone else's problem. We are all connected. We not only need to have universal health care, but we do need a universal basic income, a guarantee of meaningful employment, of a safe retirement, of housing, and of education. This pandemic brings us to the threshold of change. We just have to keep asking what kind of change we really believe in. I often think of the different versions of the future in fiction literature. Gene Roddenberry imagined the world of Star Trek in the mid-22nd century where there simply would be no currency, there's no money, because people pursue their careers based on their interests and talents, but everyone has more or less equal personal quarters, they share from the same recreational facilities, foods, and pastimes. But there's also the more dystopian types, like Mad Max, in which a society breaks down and everyone fights for whatever resources they can grab. I fear, however, that our system is much more like the Hunger Games, in which the poor are pitted into mortal competition with each other, and that that competition becomes the entertainment and security of the wealthy. And I submit that system, that hunger gain system that is the American economy, that has to stop. It can stop peacefully at the ballot box through electing a better government, or it can stop through revolution, but it has to stop. As Gandhi famously said, we have more than enough to meet the world's needs. We don't have enough to satisfy the world's greed. And I don't know about you, but I'm done trying to sacrifice enough to satisfy the greed of the 1%. We can provide safe housing, a healthy diet, meaningful work, a living wage, universal health care, and education to everyone. And because we can do it, we must do it. We have the resources to do it, and if that means we have to go from having 800 foreign military bases down to two or 300, I guess I'll get by somehow. I'm not equipped to hazard a guess how many lives will be lost this year in this pandemic. Many experts are now saying that we're only in the second inning, and we have a lot yet to endure this fall and winter. But whether the number of casualties is 65,000, or 600,000, I'm just saying they shouldn't die in vain. We have seen our society's weaknesses, and we know that we can fix them. And because we know we can fix them, there is no excuse short of damnation if we fail to do it. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.